This is the IDP After Show. Welcome to the IDP After Show. I am your host, Jeff Pumazal. It's been a wild and crazy start to free agency, maybe the most chaotic in recent memory. We saw a lot of players trading in one jersey for another. To help us make sense of all this, I'm joined by someone who shares my love of IDP, as well as Brandon Lee as the unquestioned 101 of the Crow, <laughs> Mr. Green Dot himself, Mike Wooler. Mike, how you doing? What's going on, Jeff? And you are absolutely right. I refuse to see that new movie. I watched the trailer and it was just, it was what I was expected. Yeah, it was a little bit more violence, but it's just going to be a train wreck. And that is about all the new Crow is going to get of my, of my viewing. I am not going to see that movie at all. Yeah, I don't think I can bring myself to it. That's that's one of my top five movies of all times, and I don't know if I can handle having it ruined. So, nope, I it, nope can't do it. The same thing with White Men Can't Jump. Did not watch the new one either, and it was like, why are people re? Why are people ruining the classics? These perfect movies, and you're ruining them for right. no good reason. Remake the bad ones that should have been better instead of remaking the good ones that are yes, already there. Yes, exactly. So, yes. So. All right. Well, besides movies tonight, we're going to talk a lot about uh, breaking down some of the great and not so great landing spots for some of the recent free agent signings from a fantasy perspective. We'll start with the defensive line position. Mike, who do you have up first who landed in a pretty decent spot? Uh, I think Bryce Huff. Um, I like to spot with the Eagles. Um, right now, there is still a little bit of uh, flux between Josh Sweat and Hassan Reddick. They've been rumored to be traded, but obviously they're still still uh, they're still around. But I think even still, Bryce Huff is is still in a good spot, and I think Vic Fangio is going to use him. Uh, I think pretty heavily in that rotation. Um, I think he could have his chance to shine, kind of as not maybe necessarily a full time player, but um, I, I think he could see over sixty to sixty five percent of the snaps, which which would be uh, a, a career high last season. Uh, he was at about 42 percent, uh, and during last year, he still generated. You know, he got a 20 percent pressure rate, 67 pressures, which matched his career total up to that point. So, uh, like I said, I think Fangio licking his chops with this guy, uh, even though he doesn't blitz a ton. Huff is a guy who can generate consistent pressure, and he will definitely be utilizing him uh, as part of that front four to uh, to get uh, to get pressure up front. Uh, he might use Huff in the run game because he does because Fangio does like to stop the run. So could see a few more tackle opportunities come Huff's way. Um, and then again, more opportunity for for snap volume if anything happens with Hassan Reddick or Josh Sweat. So um, I think, like I said, I think Huff is in a is in a good spot. Um, probably going to target him as a as a DE, probably DL or DL or DE, maybe two or three. Um, if you're playing in our, in that big three scoring, or if you're playing, especially in a, in a format that does offer points for tackles for loss or QB hits, you're also going to get those added points as well. So I, I definitely like the spot for Huff. Yeah. I think from a fantasy, fantasy perspective, he, he landed somewhere ideally for fantasy managers. Everyone was just hoping he got out from, from uh, the Jets and finally landed in a spot where he could be utilized and maybe rack up a few more tackles. Cause that was something that he was not doing definitely for the Jets. It was, it was all pretty heavy pressure and stuff like that sack related. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Yeah. Especially if too, like you mentioned, if Reddick moves on, I think that'll be ideal for him and his snap counts too. So yep. the efficiency will definitely come down, but we'll, yes, we'll take that. We'll take that. Yeah, efficiency a lowers punches. a bit when you get a little bit more snap volume, but I mean, just the way he generates pressure, even if it drops to 16 or 17, that is still a borderline elite number. <laughs> that would be fantastic, especially for all the shares that we have. So, well, staying in the NFC East, I, I really like where this player went, Brian Burns. Uh, he was tagged by Carolina and then traded almost immediately to the Giants. He signed a five year, $141 million contract with a 35 million guaranteed. I feel he joins a more potent defensive line playing alongside Dexter Lawrence, Kayvon Thibodeau, and Ajis Ojolari. He way more talented than he was in Carolina, where he's kind of the focal point for opposing blockers. And now he has a chance for probably a little bit more success with some of the attention being taken up by some of those other players. We did see Derek Brown take a little bit of a step forward this past season, but I still feel that New York has way more talent along that defensive line than he left in Carolina. 
Um, one of the things I really like about Burns going forward is he's been in the, above the expected sack rate the last three seasons. Just like Huff, he's really efficient when it comes to that. He had 49 sacks through his first five seasons. Um, and it's pretty incredible to think that he has 49 sacks considering he had no one really drawing any attention their way and all of the focal point was on him. So um, unlike Huff, uh, Burns offers a little bit more in the tackle department. He had 43 tackles last season, which helps kind of insulate his fantasy production a little bit higher floor. He's not one of these defensive linemen that are so sack dependent, relying on sacks and hits for his play. So he's a little bit less boomer bust from week to week. So it, that's definitely someone who you would like to have in your lineups. Um, I really think that this year his team will be a little more competitive than last year. I don't think the Giants are going to be competing for the Super Bowl, but maybe a little bit better than Carolina. We did see uh, Burns play 150 fewer snaps last year than in 2022. And I don't know if that's a result of it not being on a very competitive team and being on the wrong side of many blowout losses there in the end. So uh, currently Burns is being drafted as the DL 11, 13th player overall in current best ball drafts. Um, surprisingly, he's being taken behind Kayvon Thibodeau, which feels a little bit off to me, but I guess to each their own. So any thoughts on Mr. Burns before you get into your second player, Mike? No, I like Burns. Um, like I said, I think he definitely lands. He's going to find the sliding probably a little bit easier. Like I said, playing alongside Dexter Lawrence um, and Ojolari. I don't know something about Thibodeau. I, I don't really like, but um, I'll probably be saving that for a fade for the draft guide. So a little bit of a teaser. Yeah. Um, but no, Bur yeah, Burns is 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 a uh, a talented um, edge rusher. So yeah, definitely definitely like the spot. Were you surprised that he got uh, traded to the Giants? Yeah, I think it just was, it wasn't on the radar. So you know, the Giants just seem to fly under the radar when it comes to things like that. So um, definitely was not expecting the Giants. I was actually just expecting Burns to play out the string under his franchise tag. So I I didn't think. Um, he'd be traded, but I guess um, it kind of matches what Caroline has done. I mean, they also let their one of their their they let their top linebacker go in Frankie Louvu, so they're letting they're letting all their top guys walk, or and they're getting rid of their top yeah. guys, right? So, cool. all right, and so that brings us to your second defensive lineman that landed it in an ideal spot. And who do you have, Mike? Um, I, I wrote up Marcus Davenport. Um, I think he's going to, you know, he's playing alongside an elite guy with Aiden Hutchinson. So I think it's, it's a win-win from both for both guys. I think Aiden Hutchinson is probably going to see a little bit less, uh, could be see a little bit less attention because Marcus Davenport, when he's healthy is a talented ad rusher. His last full season with the saints, he had a 24%, almost a 25% win rate. Uh, last season he was limited to just, to just a handful of games. Um, I think he generated seven total pressures in those games. I think he could have had a, a good season. So he's got a career, almost a career 13% pressure rate. Like I said, against the Lions, I think he he finds himself on a good spot um, on that defensive line. I think they've got a pretty good, you know, they got a pretty good interior uh, with McNeil. And like I said, when you're playing alongside Aiden Hutchinson, that's going to relieve some of the attention on, on his side. So um, like I said, it's a win-win for both. And as long as Davenport stays healthy, um, you know, six to seven sacks, I don't think is out of the question. And it, it could be a, a decent t deal too. And I think just because of his injury history, I, I think he's going to be, you can have him, you can draft him pretty cheap and redraft. So I think you're going to be able to get him virtually, I mean, for free for the most part. So, and he does carry that, that upside for, uh, for production, uh, barring health. Yeah, it's nice that he's not going to be asked to be the number one guy, but he's like, like you said, playing alongside Hutchinson, he, that's just going to make everyone play better and it, the pressure mm -hmm. won't be on him to be the number one. So I think he falls in an ideal spot with the Lions. I just hope some of those eight or nine sacks don't come when they play the Packers. So that's <laughs> so. So, all right. So now that we've talked about some potential of the players landing in ideal spots. Let's flip, go to the opposite side. Who do you have as someone who you feel actually hurt their potential by signing where they did? Um, I, 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 you turn gross Matos. I think just in general, the contract just, 
puzzled me because he's getting paid like a mid-range starter and he just hasn't done anything. And I think even in San Francisco, I just, I don't foresee him really doing much of anything anyway. I mean, obviously you've got uh, Nick Bosa, you got Javon Kinlaw. Um, uh, I just wrote up the 49ers today and I, all the, some of the other names are, are eluding me in terms of who they have, but um I just I don't know. I don't like Yatura Gross Matos. I just it, I I don't see him really doing much of anything. Um, I think I don't see any. I mean, he'll probably get see some increased usage just because of the contract, but I don't see it really translating to much. He didn't really do much with Carolina, um, so I I don't like the spot, and I'm just I don't really see it in the player either. Yeah, it was kind of an interesting signing, especially since they signed uh, Floyd from Buffalo. They have Drake Jackson. From That's it. Year, Thank you. Pretty decent draft capital on it. Was, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> no, you said the name. Yeah, Some so of the I names that, that, we were... San, that they brought in eluded me. So I'm, I'm. That's that. You you just triggered one of the names that that went to San Francisco. So. <laughs> are are we going to be hearing more about Drake Jackson sometime in the future? Um. Oh, boy, I guess it, 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 just week one, and then he turns in, and then he does nothing the rest of the week, the rest of the season, right? So sell after week one, pencil, yes. pencil that down. Sell after week one. He's the he's the IDP version of Sammy Watkins. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm gonna stick with the San Francisco theme here for mine. Um, I have not been a fan of him for a long time. Uh, my my guy to fade or my guy who didn't land an ideal spot and I think you mentioned it too about the contract just really kind of was puzzling. Uh, Chase Young from San Francisco went to New Orleans. Uh, he signed a, a one year thirteen million dollar fully guaranteed contract. Um, he ranked last season as the thirty eighth overall according to PFF. Not great considering he was the second overall pick just a few seasons ago. He was he signed the sixth highest def- defensive line contract this offseason, which seemed like a lot for a player that has yet to really have that breakout season. Um, you throw in the rumors of him taking plays off during the season, possibly being benched for the Super Bowl. That full fully guaranteed contract kind of worries me for a player with that stigma around him. Uh, maybe more in an incentive based contract would have been a safer route for the the Saints, but. I guess I'm not in their front office to to work those things out, but it just seems that for a team like San Francisco who made a move for him, not even to like work at a contract to re-sign him to keep him there, uh, it seems just kind of like a red flag for me. So uh, he's currently being drafted as the 61st defensive lineman, about the 110th player being taken off the board in round nine in best ball drafts, which feels much safer of a spot than last year as he was being taken as a top 15. So, um, yeah, I just I've never been a fan of Young, and just kind of all, everything that's happened this last off season has just kind of even kind of confirmed that for me. So I am questioning his signing location. So all right, all right. So let's move now to the back end of the defense. Who is a defensive back you feel landed in an ideal spot for twenty twenty four? Uh, I you know what I think. I think Brandon Jones, I think is going to, is a, is an under the radar signing. Cause again, no Justin Simmons, um, uh, you know, you've, they've now got Caden Stearns and PJ Locke. So Jones has proved he can play a box role. Plus he's a good pass rusher. Um, he had a really efficient season with the, uh, with the dolphins. Um, uh, you know, he had a, a a 14% tackle rate in his 22 season that was cut short. Um, but yeah, I mean, things really looked for, looked up for him in 20 after that 21 season. Um, but I think just, I think Jones does kind of take that Justin Simmons role. And I think he does play kind of that, uh, that line of scrimmage, that slot box role um, uh, that, um, that you want your safeties to get putting him in line for some really good tackle opportunities. And like I said, yeah, that 21 season, he had a really good year from the, from a pass rush standpoint, I could see him utilized in that way. Um, and so I think coupled with that tackle upside, pass rush upside, he's someone, I think you're going to, another guy you can get in cheap 
um, that carries some pretty good upside. So I think with Brandon Jones, I think he's going to get, uh, I think he's going to get the snap usage and, and see kind of a, a full-time role in, in Denver. Yeah. I think both of those guys are great signings for the Broncos as far as safety room. Uh, and you can get them both very cheap. Brandon Jones and also Locke, I think are both really solid plays. I know Locke was kind of a, a waiver wire darling at the end of last season for, for many, many teams. So kind of like both of those guys on that back end of that Broncos defense. So, Well, for me, that's a little bit of homerism. I know that Kyle Bellafuel and I talked about this on the ideal landing spots episode a few weeks ago. And mine is Xavier McKinney, who signed with the Packers. Uh, he signed a four-year, $67 million deal. 23 of that is guaranteed. I feel that he's like the perfect fit for the scheme and the team now under new defensive coordinator, Jeff Halfley. Um, I just think he's really built for this hybrid role to play all over the place. Uh, he ranked fourth last season in overall grade, according to PFF, with an 87.7. He had 116 tackles, which was good for sixth among all safeties. He also racked up three interceptions. So that just kind of shows that he's kind of a, a very versatile player. He can play all over the field. Uh, currently, the Packers only have uh, Anthony Johnson Jr. as the other safety right now. So that all but guarantees that McKinney is going to be a 100% snap player. He's going to be on the field every single play. I know there's some mock drafts and things going around currently where the Packers are going to maybe take the, the kid out of Minnesota, uh, Newbin. Um, and if that happens, I think that's that, that, that's fine. It won't interfere with McKinney's role at all. Also, the Packers, as of 631 on March 27th, only have Quay Walker and Isaiah McDuffie at linebacker. So that could mean also a lot of box snaps for him. McKinney played 637 of those snaps last season for Big Blue. So it's something he's definitely more than capable of doing. He's very comfortable there. So it's not going to like put him in a position where he doesn't feel comfortable on the field. So um, currently, McKinney is the 11th safety being drafted at the moment, um, the 13th overall defensive back. And I think that that's really good value, especially for someone who finished as a top six scorer last year with 206 points in big three scoring. So I really love the, the landing spot in real football. I also love the landing spot in fake football as well. So Xavier McKinney is my my guy. So. Again, Giants just allowing their, their, their safeties to get away. That's two Alabama big hitting safeties that they've let get away. They've got, they got Pinnock there. They don't need anybody else anymore, so. No, <laughs> that's another episode, Mike. That's a, that's yeah. another episode. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, who do you have? I know that you have a disdain for Pinnock, but uh, who is someone that you would like as a defensive back to sign in an ideal spot? So, I try to write up most from my article for the landing spots. I try to write up mostly guys that found new homes, but I couldn't help but write about Taylor Rapp. He's staying in Buffalo. Um, and I think again, with him staying in Buffalo, that's definitely, I think the best fit for him, um, in terms of his IDP, IDP value coming into to the season played all 16 games, but just played 42% of the snaps, but he had a full-time role, um, in four of the games where he appeared hundred percent of the snaps. Um, as of right now, there's no more Micah high, there's no Jordan Poyer. And I think that three-year extension is, is I think a good indicator for, for him, that Buffalo does envision him uh, rap as a, a full-time player. Um, so I think uh, coupled that with his, with his increased usage played about 40% of his snaps near the line of scrimmage. So I see that increasing um, with new defensive coordinator, Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer actually enjoyed very productive seasons. So I could see uh, Babbage really uh, helping rap uh, get that level of production that, that Jordan Poyer had. So uh, I think he's going to play that uh, play that similar role with uh, with 55% of his snaps over the the line of scrimmage. Solid tackler. He had an 8.8% tackle rate during his career with the Rams, which actually is a pretty decent number for a defensive back. Um, although he did just had just 42% of the snaps, um, he had 11.8% tackle rate when he was a full time player, and uh, and that resulted in over 30 tackles in those full time snaps. So he is a productive tackler at at the safety position. So I think for a landing spot, staying put in Buffalo will definitely help his IDP value. And I think again, he's one of those uh, zero, I guess you could say zero DB targets. Um, and I think he's looking like a solid DB two, DB three. Um, 
in best ball and redraft league. So uh, I, I like Taylor Rapp uh, staying put in Buffalo. Isn't every DB a zero DB? Isn't yes. How... <laughs> yeah, outside of the top five, yeah, outside of those those top five, which are guys I'll never, I'll probably never draft. Yes, it's all it's all zero DB. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, and, and the nice thing about Rap is we've seen him do it before. It's not like he's signing and we're speculating that he's going to be in a great spot. He's actually done it the mm-hmm. 2021 season that he was with the Rams. He was. He was like a top 10 finisher. Like he 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 mm-hmm. was really, really balling out. And then for whatever reason, just kind of disappeared that next season and then ended up in Buffalo. So yep. All right. Well, when we have players gain value, that means somebody else has to lose value. So Mike, who do you have as someone on the defensive back position who you feel might disappoint a little next season in their new home? Well, I think with Von Bell returning back to Cincinnati, I think that could have some kind of a, a ripple effect on on everybody. Um, Lou Adam Marumo loves Von Bell, so it could be possible that he sees a, a full-time role right away, um, which could have kind of a ripple effect like a, on, on, on battle on Dax Hill, um, on, on all the guys. So I think there's a lot of mouths to feed in Cincinnati when it comes to the safety position. So I, I don't really like the spot for Bell. Plus his production has been down over the last several years. He is getting up in age, um, Although the signing, it could end up being a veteran presence where he's just kind of a veteran in the in the locker room to be a leader, or maybe he doesn't have a full time role. But that's not something I'm willing to to take a chance on. So, um, just uh, I, I don't like the the spot for Bell in Cincinnati. Yeah, it was kind of a, an odd signing too, just because they went with this whole youth movement on the defensive side, obviously to clear up cap space to take care of the offensive pieces. But and then for Bell to come back, he just kind of doesn't fit with their youth movement at all. So like you said, it might be a, a veteran presence kind of there, uh, someone who kind of write the ship in that secondary, maybe teach those younger guys how to, how to be professionals there. So be interesting to see how that plays out. My not so great landing spot is probably going to be a little hot take for some people. Uh, Kevin Byard uh, signed with the bears after playing the season with the Philadelphia Eagles, a two year, $15 million deal. 11 of that is guaranteed. He ranked 30th overall last season in 2023. He played just under 1,200 snaps, racked up 127 tackles. Uh, It's not so much about Bayard as a player as it's the fit for me in that Bears defense. Uh, Jaquan Brisker is clearly the box safety in Chicago and just not sure how the snaps are going to play out or how he's going to be aligned in Chicago. Chicago has way better linebackers than Bayard's ever played with, even with his time in Tennessee and last year in Philadelphia. He got a lot of a tackle opportunities because he didn't have those linebackers in front of him. He goes to Chicago. He's got Brisker to compete with. He's got two very solid linebackers in Edmonds and in uh, Edwards. So I don't think he's going to see the tackle opportunities that he had in the past. So that's going to kind of take a little ding on his on his performance from 2023. Um, he's currently being drafted as safety 27 at the moment, which seems really, really high considering we're questioning uh, his snap alignment, his role on the defense, and like the, as for mentioned, the linebackers are better in front of him. So that's going to be a, an easy pause for me to either sell or kind of avoid in taking in drafts. So. I agree. I, that's, uh, I, I felt like I was on an island writing Kevin Byard up as in a as a bad la- in a bad landing spot. So uh good to see that it, that that we are sharing the uh the island and that I don't have to rely on old Wilson the do- the the volleyball to uh to talk to on this on the island. I don't know you might get more out of Wilson than you do out of me but it, well at least <laughs> at least they'll have a comedy there so at least we'll be fine. So we'll talk about Brandon Lee as the crow so. All right. So it's come to the part of the show where everyone has been waiting for the time for the position that everyone is always intrigued about. Mike, who is your favorite future green dotter and who should we be looking at next season? Um, I did have a few linebackers ahead of, of who I, of who I'm going to mention, but um, you can read about him in the article, but uh, Kenneth Murray uh, with the Titans, um, the Titans lost uh, Aziz Alshir to free agency, went over to, uh, to Houston, um, they replace so they use Murray as their replacement. I think he just ended up wearing out his welcome with uh, with the Chargers. Um, I think he gets a, a fresh start with the t- with the Titans. 
I mean, is he an upgrade? Probably not. I mean, PFF had him graded as kind of an average off-ball linebacker, does have some deficiencies in coverage. Um, but during his, his four years with the Chargers, he appeared in over 780 defensive snaps, uh, Was did wear the dot for the defense in uh, in 2020, last season, due to Tranquil's departure. So he does have that uh, experience of calling the plays and keeping everybody in line from the huddle. Appeared in 94, 94% of the snaps, had 79 pass rush snaps. So there's also some pass rush upside. Uh, when he does see more than 90% of the snaps, I think he can pretty much count on uh, 100, uh, 100 tackles. Uh, it was the case of his rookie year and last season. Uh, had an 11.1% tackle rate, which kind of puts him on that lower LB2, LB, LB2, LB3 tier. So there's not much competition for snaps. Um, I think he should have a three down roll, should wear the dot as the play caller. Um, Jack Gibbons could see some increased usage, but, um, you know, outside of, of Murray's coverage, um, he is a pretty versatile uh, linebacker, should fill that void. Um, so I'm projecting him to kind of have that three down roll, call the plays at least. That's what I'm getting from the uh, the free agent capital that the Titans spent the money on. So I think they'd be a full. I think it would be a waste of money to to use him as a part time player. No, and I love the pass rushing ability that he has. He had a couple sacks last season, and we didn't see that with Al Shire when he played mm -hmm. for the Titans. So I think that that's like an added bonus. So I, I'm projecting a very similar season to Al, Al, Al Shire, um, just with more sacks. I think he'll have a, a better run there than he did. So yep. I like that call. I like like that for the former number one pick by San Diego. It was San Diego then when he got drafted, I think. So, all right. For my number one linebacker, uh, I'm going to go with Josie Jewell, Panthers. Uh, we mentioned the Broncos a few other times before about kind of cleaning house with things. Uh, Jewell moved from Denver to Carolina, signed a three-year, $19 million contract. Ten of it was guaranteed. His new defensive coordinator is also a former coach of his from Denver. Um, Ijiro Ivero, if I'm mispronouncing your name. Pretty close. <laughs> okay. I apologize for that. Uh, he did coach Jewel in Denver. So there's some continuity there. Uh, we see this all the time, especially with players in year one of a contract. Uh, coach definitely wants to have their guy on the field as someone that they can lean on, someone who understands the, the play calling and scheme. And Jewel is a very cerebral player. And so he kind of fits that mold. And I think it's what he's going to fit into in Carolina. Uh, Luvu who signed with Washington vacates nearly a thousand snaps from last season. And I can totally see Carolina using jewel to kind of fill a majority, if not all of those snaps next year. Uh, Shaq Thompson is the only holdover at linebacker and he's coming off a pretty significant leg injury. And so there's a lot of new pieces on that Carolina front seven for sure. Um, they don't have a lot of draft capital to spend. They spent so much on the trade last year with Bryce young. I don't see them spending a lot of capital on the defensive side of the ball. Probably going to focus their efforts on the offensive side. Carolina did add some pieces this offseason with Ashawn Robinson, DJ Wunham, and Derek Brown obviously is still there. And then just recently they just signed J Jadavion Clowney. So there's definitely some pieces in front of him that should kind of keep him relatively clean, um, draw some attention away so that he can just do what he needs to do and rack up tackles. So expecting a very good season statistically from um, Jules and Jewel. Um, if you're into the game script narrative, I can see the Panthers being in a lot of losing games late in the game. So the other teams may be running out the clock and that just pads his tackle numbers as opposing opposing teams are trying to run out the clock for him. I think you're getting an absolute steal with Jewel right now. He's going off as linebacker 62 in best ball drafts. He's not even being drafted as a weekly starter at this point. And I could easily see him with a floor of linebacker three and probably LB two upside most weeks. So um, if you can get him on a throw in deal right now or flip a, a late third or even a fourth round in dynasty picks, I think he's totally worth worth that, especially what you're probably going to be getting normally from those draft picks. So uh, Jewel is a layup for me at this point. So. Yep. I like the spot too, for sure. And you were going to mention something about uh, Clowney. You said yet you had some nuggets. Yeah. With, yeah. With Clowney with, with Carolina, it's, it's funny. I think Clowney's play goes as the team goes. So that first year in Cleveland, he had a solid year. Um, the defense was, you know, the, the defense was pretty, pretty hyped up. 
Um, his second year was in Cleveland was not so great, but with Baltimore obviously playing with the number one seed, probably had a, probably had his best year of his career. But now that he's in Carolina, uh, I I don't know. Just some something about Clowney. I don't I don't have I don't see him definitely. I don't see him repeating what he did in Baltimore because uh, I think just the situation is going to dictate his play. Um, if that makes any sense, so I just. I, I don't see that same drive or that same motivation uh, with Carolina um, that he did, you know, with that first year in Cleveland and last year with Baltimore. Yeah. He seemed to be almost like him and Burns are kind of in the same boat. They almost seem to be like the finishing pieces on a team ready to make a, a really late playoff push Super Bowl run. And the giants are clearly pieces away and to invest so heavily in Burns and then to have, Clowney sign with Carolina, who's clearly not anywhere near making a playoff push. They almost seem like, I don't want to say a luxury signing, but it was mm-hmm. almost like they could have gone somewhere else to, to probably be in a better situation for them as in their career. But I guess if no one's calling and you want to get paid, I guess you're going to go wherever that paycheck's being signed from. So, yeah, money talks. <laughs> so true. So speaking of money talking, we got our next linebacker up. And who do you have landing in an ideal spot? Uh, I got Jordan Hicks. Um, I think he's, I think Cleveland's a good spot for him. Um, Anthony Walker, Sam Taki Taki are, have moved on to, to Miami, New England respectively. So all of those snaps have opened up. Um, I think Hicks for the most part has shed his injury prone label, um, after battling some injuries at the beginning of the season. Um, you know, over his first three season, he appeared in 31 games, but over those next six, he'd appear in 12 or more games. Uh, last year had a really bad leg injury and it was not anything that I'd heard of, but it was called compartment syndrome. I thought his season was done, but he came back to fi- play the final few weeks of the season. So, um, you know, he's a solid veteran full-time linebacker. He's appeared in over 800 defensive snaps in five straight games. He knows defenses. He can call defenses. Um, he's, he, he can communicate well, um, He's recorded also some sacks. He's got eight sacks over the last three seasons, and he's recorded 105 or more tackles in five straight seasons. And his missed tackle rate is is also pretty uh, has also come down. He's had a missed tackle rate of less than 10 percent in in three straight seasons. So he's cleaned up his tackling, and that just means more points. So I think this he's a veteran, fits in well with the Browns defense. I think he does have some familiarity with Jim Schwartz during their time in in Philly, if I'm not mistaken. So. Schwartz has a, a guy that he can put in the middle, call the defense and, and keep everybody in line. So, um, you know, Jacob Phillips, I've always liked him, but he can't stay healthy. Owusu Koromo is more on that weak side plays outside. So I think it would be a mistake to honestly, I think it'd be a, a mistake to give him the dot. I don't think that's what he, that's not what he's comfortable with. He's just a guy, just let him go. So I think he should be in line for the green dot. I think he's in line for a full-time role or close to a three down role. He's one of those boring guys that just continues to produce. And until those wheels fall off, you can still get him as a nice LB3, LB4 yeah, near the middle to the end of the draft. Yeah, it was definitely one of those guys that he just seems to keep showing up on my teams and rosters all the time. Just like he's been playing forever, even when he got drafted by Arizona and then he went to Philly mm-hmm. and Minnesota for a couple of seasons. And he'll probably be on a couple of my teams, even as a Brown. So. Yeah, I like the sign, and, and just as a Browns fan, I like the signing. I think it was, you know, to, when when they lost Walker, I'm like, oh, that really sucks because he's again one of those veteran guys that, although from a fantasy standpoint, not something you're going to count on, but a guy that that rallies the guys, communicates, and just keeps everybody together. And I think Jordan Hicks um, brings that to Cleveland, and you know, just he 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 brings the 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 tackle numbers. So I think the the IDP numbers. So that's just obviously an added bonus, but I definitely like the the signing for, for the Browns from a real fam, football standpoint too. Do you think the Browns let Walker walk, no pun intended, because of the injuries and just not being able to be, stay on the field or? Well, I, I prob- uh, probably. Um, yeah, I mean, this team is, you know, say what you will about the quarterback position, but the team is in, in, in position to compete, to win the rosters built to win. And you got, you need guys that are going to stay on the field. Yeah. Especially when you're taking on Baltimore twice a season. So yeah, <laughs> again, that's a, that's a topic for another episode, Mike. So just, <laughs> all right. So 
again, we have a lot of players finding new homes, making their potential value, especially at the linebacker position, really, really enticing. Mike, who is some a linebacker that you have that isn't going to be as enticing as they were just a few weeks ago? Well, it pains me to say, but I, it's Willie Gay. I've, I've always, I, I was so hoping he would land in a spot where he'd actually be able to like get on the field, but signs with the, uh, the saints for a one-year deal. And I, I just don't like it. He's, he saw 69% of the snaps in 22 and I'm thinking, okay, 23 is going to be the year, but he dipped to 62% of the snaps in the ocean and Drew Tranquil got snapped. So, um, so there was a glimmer of hope, but unfortunately it's faded. Uh, the saints were primarily a heavy nickel defense. They were mostly in those two linebacker packages and it was Pete Warner and Demario Davis. So with saints rarely running base defense, I don't see where the, where the snaps are going to happen um, for Willie Gay, you know, outside of something happening to Davis or, or Pete Werner. So he's uh, unfortunately probably not going to be anybody that, that I have any interest in, unfortunately, which really stinks. Cause I really liked, I really like him. Good speedy linebacker, good thumper. And um, like I said, was hoping free agency, he'd land in a spot where he'd get, um, where he'd see some full-time snaps. There weren't many landing spots for Willie to land in that were worse than Kansas City, but I think he found maybe the one spot he might that have. really was the worst spot to land in than Kansas City. So, yeah, it's unfortunate for for him and his his fantasy manager stats, especially. So, yep. So, well, it's only a one year deal, so maybe he has some some light at the end of the tunnel. So. Speaking of, well, I guess not having any light at the end of the tunnel, um, my linebacker who for a brief moment was probably landed in an ideal spot. Everyone was kind of like, this is it, this is it. And then he lasted for about 24 hours. And then Bobby Wagner signed. Frankie Lubu signed with the Commanders for a three-year, $31 million deal. Uh, one, uh, Lubu was clearly the winner after initially signing. Um, but then complete opposite once Wagner signed his one-year deal worth $8.5 million. So he's clearly not going to come off the field. Um, they have Jamin Davis, who is also there, but he's dealing with some legal issues still from his audition tape for a Fast and the Furious movie. Um, so he, there's clearly some rotational role that's going to be coming in 2024. Not sure what that's going to look like. If they do play a 4-3 scheme, who's going to be stuck playing that strong side, which is obviously the least desirable position among the linebacker positions. Luvu played and scored really well last season along Shaq Thompson, but Wagner, even at his advanced age, I feel is probably far superior than Frank, uh, than uh, Shaq Thompson could ever dream to be. So I could easily see Luvu losing opportunities at the position to Wagner. Um, right now, Luvu is being taken as the linebacker 14, which seems really drafting him as an absolute ceiling right now in best ball drafts. I would rather pass on him, let someone else deal with that. And I would rather draft a player like Logan Wilson, Alex Singleton, Levante David, CJ Mosley, who are all being drafted after him at the moment. Uh, I think you're drafting Luvu at 14 as his absolute ceiling, especially this year with, with Wagner in town. So 2025 might be a different story, but you're still going to have a year to, of headaches to put up with that. So. All right. So Mike, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, since linebacker is like the only reason people ever listen to these shows and read articles, <laughs> uh, do you have a, another linebacker, good or bad, that you feel is worth mentioning at this time? Yeah, I'm I'm liking Terrell Dotson um, in Seattle with Jordan Brooks and and Bobby Wagner gone. I mean that's that's two thousand snaps that have opened up. So um, I know Seattle also brought in Jerome Baker, but. His tackle efficiency has been on the decline over the last several years as a full-time linebacker. Um, it's dropped below 9% over those last few years, and that's just not something that I'm very interested in. Um, I definitely like um, uh, Terrell Dotson's landing spot. Um, he came on in Matt Milano's, in, in Matt Milano's absence, so um, I think he did have his uh, highest tackle rate. Um, had his highest usage rate. So I think with Seattle definitely finds himself with, uh, with an opportunity for a full-time role, maybe a three down role calling the plays. I think he's had a little bit of experience of that with, with Buffalo and um, 
you know, in dirt has a, uh, you know, he's working with a clean slate. So um, I think he's, uh, I think he's going to get some, some, uh, I think he's definitely going to use uh, Dotson as that, uh, as a three down, as a three down player. Cause that's primarily what Seattle's been. I mean, we'll, we'll see what Mike McDonald and dirt do, but with Mike McDonald, I mean, last year they were primarily that nickel defense. They were using two linebackers on the field at all times. So I do envision probably Dotson and Baker seeing the field um, as three down linebackers, but I prefer Dotson for uh, for his definitely preferred production and tackle efficiency. Totally agree. I think he's going to have a fantastic season, especially if they, they don't draft a linebacker early in the draft. That would be my only hesitation with, with him. Yep. Um, yep. But I, I think, like you said, too, I think Dotson is much safer of an investment at this point than Baker, um, just because of the production in the past few years. So I've never been a Baker fan for some reason, but I don't know. He actually went to my son's high school. So kind of cool. He went oh, to wow. Benedict and he went to Benedict in high school in Cleveland. And actually, I think over the summer, I think he made an appearance. So, I mean, it is kind of cool. He is a local guy, so I'll give him that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, as far as fantasy, I have to separate. I have to separate the two. And right now, I he's just not. He's just not getting it done. Well, that's fantastic stuff, Mike. I appreciate you being here. Um, what are you working on right now? And uh, where can the listeners find more of your fantastic work? So yes, I am new with the IDP show this year. Uh, just finishing up my NFC defensive coaching changes article. Uh, you can find my AFC one that's up. So uh, you can find my defensive uh, NFC article here probably within the next day or two, just putting some some finishing touches on it. Uh, we'll be talking some rookies here uh, over the next couple of weeks, um, then contributions in the draft kit. So Find me at the IDP show as uh, for this season and follow me on Twitter at Mike underscore Wolder. That's awesome. We're very pleased and blessed to have you join. So it's fantastic stuff. So, well, that'll about do it for this episode of the IDP after show. Join me next time as I'm joined by David Kelly, as we talk about his article and takeaways from the IDP best ball drafts from last season, we'll be talking about what he learned the data and the trends that he found and how that can help you prepare to dominate your upcoming best ball draft. That season is already upon us until then, you know what to do. Be sure to like follow and subscribe and make sure you hit that notification button. So you never miss an episode of the IDP show or the IDP after show for Mike. I'm Jeff saying thank you for tuning in and we'll catch up with you next time. This was the IDP after show. <laughs>